Hi friends, welcome back to another episode of Generation Tech. My name is Alan. Today we continue our Clone Wars history series with our coverage of the third year of the Clone Wars. Before we begin today's episode, don't forget to subscribe and hit that notification button down below. In our last episode, we took a look at the potential civil war between the Naboo and Gungans. Today we'll be looking at one of the deadliest campaigns of the entire Clone Wars, the Battle of Umbara. Chapter 7, The Battle of Umbara. It's relatively difficult to create a standardized army that works against all types of enemies on all types of terrain, environments on all types of worlds. While the Grand Army of the Republic's main foe was the Separatist Alliance and their droid armies, the Republic would oftentimes have to engage local planetary defense forces and local militias. The planet of Umbara was located in the expansion region of the galaxy and carefully hidden within the Ghost Nebula. Its location meant that it was more or less cut off from the rest of the galaxy, and visitors rarely stepped foot on Umbara, and Umbarans rarely left their home planet. It's for this reason that the Umbarans were able to develop advanced technologies that were quite different from the rest of the galaxy. This included very advanced weapons and vehicles that the Republic forces have never seen before. At the beginning of the Clone Wars, the Umbarans had been a member state of the Republic, but joined the Confederacy shortly after their representative was assassinated on Coruscant. It should also be noted that Umbara had a massive reserve of dunium on their planet, which was a crucial material used in the construction of starships, and of course, Republic strategists could not let this dunium fall into Separatist hands, and so they launched an invasion onto Umbara. The Republic sends a task force of six Jedi and the 501st Legion and a 212th Attack Battalion to convince the planet to rejoin the Republic. Their main target is the capital city of Umbara, Umbara. The plan was simple. The 212th would land to the south and establish a foothold before advancing onto the city from that location, while Anakin's 501st Legion would advance from the north. Umbara was constantly bathed in darkness thanks to the lack of any bright stars in the vicinity of the planets, and the surface was also covered in fog, limiting visibility. Anakin would send his forces straight in on LAAT gunships with minimal fighter coverage. He would then use a giant pool of ATRT mechanized walkers to lead an assault on unbarn positions at the LZ and follow up with his infantry forces. The idea was to use speed and surprise to overwhelm the enemy defenses before they could regroup and strike back. The Umbaran militia was equipped with advanced combat suits that pumped performance-enhancing gases into their soldiers. The landing zone was also defended by Umbaran hover tanks, which fired massive electromagnetic plasma projectiles, which could do a ton of splash damage. But the hover tanks' firing rates and projectiles are too slow to take out the clone's ATRT, and soon most of the hover tanks are destroyed around the LZ, and the Umbarans are routed. Anakin's bold and aggressive attack seems to have paid off at first. Aside from some giant carnivorous plants, there are very few clone casualties in this initial assault. But the Umbaran militia has actually purposely retreated to better defensive positions, and soon the Republic forces rush right into a trap and are surrounded in a valley and under heavy fire from nearby hilltops and fortifications. At the same time, the Umbarans have deployed several millicreep droids. These were tiny insect-like weapons that could crawl into enemy positions and electrocute organics. Several clones were taken down before the Republic forces realized what was going on, having to deal with both the millicreep droids within their perimeter and the Umbaran militia closing in around them, Anakin quickly decides to call in an airstrike right on top of their position. It's a risky call, but ultimately a good call. Anakin has once again prevented his soldiers from being overrun. But as they regroup and prepare to march on the capital, Anakin is recalled to Coruscant by Chancellor Palpatine. He is to be replaced by Jedi Master Pong Krell. We're not really sure why Palpatine withdraws Anakin from the battlefield and whether he does it on purpose. You guys can be the judge of that. Now, Pong Krell was an extremely well-respected Jedi Master who also happened to be an excellent commander. He was known as an individual who always made sure to reach his objectives and take them, but he was also known for exposing his clones to massive casualties. Things immediately start off pretty bad between Krell and the 501st. Captain Rex, who was used to being treated as an equal by Anakin Skywalker, Obi-Wan Kenobi, and Ahsoka Tano, found Krell to be both disrespectful and even cruel towards him and the rest of the clones. Still, clones obey the chain of command, and Krell has proven himself to be an excellent combat leader. 
The 501st continue marching on the road to the capital, and en route they're attacked by a pair of banshees, just another example of the wonderful local fauna. Krell shows off some impressive Jedi stunts and manages to grab one of them in mid-air and slaughters it. Far less impressive, though, is his strategy to continue towards the capital using the main road. The Umbarans by this point know that the Republic are coming and their infantry column is completely exposed. Without armor or air cover on station, the clones are relatively vulnerable to an Umbaran counterattack. But Krell wants speed and orders the clones to attack along the main road directly towards the city anyway. One of the forward platoons of the 501st column quickly stumbles upon a landmine field and prepared defenses and triggers an Umbaran ambush. The platoon manages to hold up against the initial heavy Umbaran onslaught and are able to break contact long enough to retreat to the rest of the 501st, and together the clones beat back the ambush. But before the 501st can advance again, the Umbarans launch another even heavier counterattack. Things are not going well, and casualties are starting to increase. But just in the nick of time, Obi-Wan Kenobi with the 212th Attack Battalion sends an order to the 501st to take over a nearby Umbaran airfield that is resupplying the capital. It should be a much easier target for the 501st to take, and so quickly they disengage and march towards it. Upon reaching the outskirts of the airbase, Rex prepares to have his men scout out the defenses of the location. But once again, Krell stresses the urgency of the situation and tells his men to quickly launch a frontal assault on the airbase with no scouting or preparation. To make matters worse, the path to the airbase that he wants them to take goes right through a gorge that is so narrow that the men will have to file through in single file order. The clones are close to mutinying, which is quite shocking and almost never happens. But once again, Rex reins them in and tries to make the best of a terrible situation. The clones are immediately attacked by strange caterpillar tanks armed to the teeth, and then a massive spider-like Umbaran tank appears over the horizon. The Republic has never encountered such vehicles and don't know exactly how to bring them down. To make matters worse, most of these vehicles are heavily shielded. Things are looking quite grim, but the clones are some of the best fighters in the galaxy, and they quickly improvise strategies to tackle these new enemy vehicles. Still, the massive Umbaran spider tanks are way too heavily armored to bring down with conventional weapons, so Rex sends Fives and Hardcase to steal two Umbaran starfighters from the airfield and try to use them to take out the tank. Umbaran vehicles have extremely different control interfaces in their cockpits, and these starfighters don't even have physical cockpits. Instead, the pilot is simply ray shielded in a bubble. Luckily, the clones manage to eventually get these ships into the air, and they quickly wreak havoc on the Umbaran forces down below and take out the massive Umbaran spider tanks. Shortly after, the 501st marches into the airbase victoriously and seizes it for the Republic, despite Krell's terrible leadership. With the airbase now under their control, the Umbarans launch several offensives to retake their territory. Meanwhile, on the other side of the city, the 212th are being pushed back away from the capital thanks to new long-range missiles that are being supplied to the Umbarans by Separatist supply ships. The Republic's own fleet is outgunned by the Zebras fleet over the planet, and they're unable to stop these shipments. Before Krell can coordinate with Kenobi on how to assault the city next, their connection breaks, and so Krell decides once again that attack is the best way forward, and tells Rex to prepare the 501st for another frontal assault against the city in 12 hours. When Rex relays this information to his men, they of course disapprove of the General's orders. Five suggest an alternative strategy. He and a few of the other clones could pilot the captured Umbaran starfighters and use them to infiltrate the Separatist fleet and destroy their supply ships from within. Krell, of course, vetoes this idea immediately, and so Fives, along with Jesse and Hardcase, disobey orders and immediately launch their mission. They fly straight into orbit and directly through a massive space melee between Umbaran and Separatist forces and the Republic Navy. Fives tells his fellow clones a story that Anakin Skywalker had told them about. When he was a child, he had successfully blown up an entire droid control ship during the blockade of Naboo. The clones decide to follow that strategy and fly straight into the Separatist supply ship. The plan almost works, but at the last moment, the droids commanding the ship notice their presence and turns on a ray shield preventing the clones from reaching the ship's reactor. And so, Hardcase takes a fuel pod off of his starfighter and runs right through the ray shield, sacrificing himself. The mission is a tremendous success, and the long-range missile shipments are halted. But immediately after returning to the airbase, Krell has Fives and Jesse arrested for treason. 
The Jedi Master is furious at them and does not give them any trial. Instead, he orders them to be executed immediately. But as Fives and Jesse are lined up before a firing squad, their fellow clones refuse to fire at them and spare their lives. They clearly have sided with their fellow clones against General Krell, which is probably why Palpatine had those control chips inserted in their brains. The clones are far more individualistic than one might think. But before Krell can do anything about the clones' insubordination, their comms receive transmissions that Umbaran forces are preparing to attack the airbase, but this time using captured clone armor and helmets in their vanguard. Krell decides to launch the 501st into a preemptive strike against the enemy, and they meet in the heavy jungles outside the airbase. Casualties quickly begin to mount on both sides as they start opening fire with small arms and mortars. Captain Rex, though, senses something was wrong and closes into melee range and knocks out one of the Umbarns wearing clone armor and finds out that they are, in fact, shooting at the 212th Attack Battalion. Rex quickly calls for a ceasefire and the two sides stop fighting, shocked by the amount of casualties they have just inflicted on their fellow clones. Rex finds out that the 212th had received the same intel as they have that Umbarns dressed as clones were about to attack them. He then quickly traces that intel directly to General Krell. By this time, Rex has had enough and he brings a group of clones to confront and arrest the Jedi Master in his tower. Krell admits to being a traitor. He's clearly fallen to the dark side at this point and wants to become Count Dooku's apprentice. A fight ensues between the clones and the Jedi and leads to the outside of the base, where a giant carnivorous plant attacks Krell, distracting him long enough for the clones to step in and stun him. But of course, Krell doesn't last long in captivity as one of the clones ends up shooting him in cold blood. Shortly after, the 212th Attack Battalion under the command of Master Kenobi managed to take the city of Umbara, ceasing all hostilities on the planet. But the clones of the 501st are shook by this incident. They have been betrayed by their commander, the one person they were supposed to obey and trust no matter what. Rex confines and fives his concerns about the war. He's starting to lose sight of why they were fighting anymore, and he's worried about what will happen to all the clones once the war ends. The Battle of Umbar was probably one of the most difficult ordeals for the 501st and the 212th during the Clone Wars. Not only were they facing a very difficult enemy, they also had heavy casualties, including friendly fire incidents. Now, the incident with Krell has really shook the trust between the Jedi and the clones, and we're gonna see this kind of breakdown in trust uh, continue to develop in the third and fourth year of the Clone Wars. Well, guys, I hope you enjoyed today's episode. Don't forget to subscribe and hit that notification button down below so you don't miss out on the rest of this series. And as usual, thanks for joining us today. If you're watching this, you are Generation Tech.